We pick it up tonight in Psalm 81. And the psalmist to the chief musician on an instrument of Gath, a psalm of Asaph. And Asaph writes and says, Sing aloud to God our strength. Make a joyful shout to the God of Jacob. Raise a song and strike the timbrel, the pleasant harp with the lute. Blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon, at the full moon on the solemn feast day. And so, you know, it sounds like they're kind of enjoying themselves, aren't they, in these early couple of verses. Sing aloud, make a joyful shout, raise a song, strike the timbrel, the pleasant harp uh, with the lute, blow the trumpet. And so there's a real celebration going on among God's people here in this psalm. And he says, verse 4, For this is a statute for Israel and a law of the God of Jacob. This he established in Joseph for a testimony when he went throughout the land of Egypt where I heard a language that I did not understand. And so the psalmist is celebrating the deliverance of God's people from Egypt. And that's what the celebration is. For us, it's a picture of being delivered from the world and the ways of the world. The Bible talks in the New Testament talks about God providing for us so great a salvation. And so as they celebrated that deliverance of by God out of Egypt, so too there's that excitement in our heart over the salvation that God has given to us. And, and you know, one of the goofy things is that when we walk with the Lord for a while, it's just always good as we see continually in the Scriptures. He takes them back to those basics, back to the simple things and the celebrating of those things. And, and so the passage, it, it can search us tonight. You know, when is the last time you know, we broke out a kazoo over our salvation, you know, and sang in the shower or did something, you know, just in thanksgiving for what he's done. And he describes the condition there uh, in Egypt and what God delivered them from. Verse 6, I removed his, uh, I removed his shoulder from the burden. Of course, we were, had the burden of sin lifted off of us. You know, and again, I, I've been saved for a little while and, and, um, and I, and I have to stop and remember a little. What was it like to just live under constant guilt? And, and so here was this remembrance. I mean, I don't want to remember it too well, but, but just for there to be that thanksgiving provoked within our heart of, what He lifted off of us. And my, what He lifted off of us. And I am, uh, you know, by the grace of God, I, I, Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, be strong in the grace, you know, that is in Christ Jesus. And I like to be strong in His grace. And I, I, I don't, I, it's a rare time, you know, that Satan even tries anymore to pull me back into memories of what I was before I came to know the Lord and all. And sometimes He'll try it, you know, and, and all. And I need the Lord to remind me. You don't go back there. But, but um, boy, what he has, what a burden He has lifted from us. His hands were freed from the baskets. And so the Lord gave Him not only the removal of the burden, but freedom just as He's given to us. You called in trouble and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder and I proved you at the waters of Meribah. Then uh, God admonishes His people now for forsaking Him. And He says, Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you. O Israel, if you will listen to Me. And it's really sad when God can come to His people after all He's done, and it's questionable whether they'll even listen to Him. You know, let alone heed and, and do it. Um, it, it's, it's sad that God would have to do that with them, but He does. He says, O Israel, if you will listen to Me, there shall be no foreign God among you, nor shall you worship any foreign God. I am the Lord your God. Not these others. I'm your God. Maybe some of us need to be reminded of that tonight. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Those other gods couldn't do it. I'm the one that brought you out of that life. And open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. The Lord longing, you know, you have the image of the bird opening its mouth, you know, and God says, just open your mouth to me, you know, not to the gods of this world and, 
and all, but just turn to me, open your mouth, I'll fill it, I'll do it. But, you know, the, the competition that he receives, it's undue competition, but it's competition nonetheless, and it keeps us from turning our mouth to him and opening it up for him to bless us and fill us as he desires to do. Verse 11, but my people would not heed my voice, and Israel would have none of me. And so I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. And so that's the worst punishment of all, where God says, listen, you're not interested in me, you're not interested in anything I have to say. So um, there's a cure for that, and that is living under your own wisdom. So sayonara, uh, you know, see you when you want me again. And, and I mean, and he'll back off. And then when I've had my own ways again, and I realize that I've done what? Put myself right back in Egypt. And, and then now I'm willing to listen to him. And so he laments the fact that they preferred their own counsel and their own wisdom over his wisdom. And then verse 13 begins a lament of God. And this is God speaking. I mean, look at it. He says, oh, that my people would listen to me. That's something he can't even get his... Oh, he doesn't expect the world to listen to him. He said, if I could just get my people to listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. And so here is this you know, great regret that he has here concerning the competition that he's receiving to the, fact, the degree that his people wouldn't even listen to him and wouldn't walk in his ways. And I, I just, you know, I feel bummed for God. I really do. I mean, that may sound blasphemous or something, but I, I do. You ever just kind of driving down the street or walking down the street and you see a person that's obviously alone or obviously lonely? I don't know about you, but my heart really goes, you know, goes out to them. And, and here is the Lord in, in this situation that he's in. And he said, I mean, everyone's listening to some other voice but my voice. I can't get anyone to hear. And I, and I have been a Christian long enough and a pastor long enough to, you know, see so many cycles of things go through the body of Christ. And, and they'll latch on to this next thing, and this next thing, and this next thing, and this next thing. And it always crashes and burns, and, and still the attaching to the next thing. And God's just saying there, and He just say to His own people, again, we're not talking about, to His own people, and He says, I mean, it, will anyone just listen to me? Will anyone just turn to my word and find out what I have to say about these situations and then just do them. And that's, that's, that's what he's longing for. And I think, you know, is I, and I, and I don't mean to be critical, but I mean, we have to address some different things, but so often is in a lot of the different bookstores, Christian bookstores, and the different things you hear on the radio and stuff, and, and it's the bringing in of these other things rather than the Word of God and the teaching of the people and, and the, all of these philosophies of men and all of these ologies and all, you know, and it's just, and God just looking at it and, he, and He's just saying, it should be nice if someone listened to me related to these things. And, and notice what He promises if a person will listen to Him. He said, I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. In other words, God's people were looking other places for victory. And, and so often you see that. People say, well, I really need victory, and I need victory here in this area of my life, and I need victory in this. And they head off into some you know, vain philosophy of man, and God's saying, I have the victory. I'm the one that provides it. I just don't give my word independent of myself. I give my word, and I stand behind my word personally in, in, in any person's Life And so they were trying to find victory someplace else, and he was eager to give them victory. He said, verse 15, the haters of the Lord would pretend submission to him, but their fate would, uh, their fate would endure forever. He would have fed them uh, also with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock I would have satisfied you. And so God says not only were they looking for victory, but looking for it apart from me, He said they were looking for abundance, an abundant life, a blessed life. And he said, I was eager to give it to them and give it to the nation, but they wouldn't turn to me for it. You know, it must be sad. You you think about your father or grandfather or whatever, and how eager you are within your budget, (laughs) you know, 
to bless your children or grandchildren with presents and that kind. And here's God just like loaded up with stuff that He just wants to give away to His kids and He, and he can't get any takers. He can't get anyone that's going to even you know, stretch an arm out to receive it. And so I think that you look at that, those final words of, la- of verse 16 where He said, I would have satisfied you. And I, I really, this psalm to me is the I would have psalm. I think that the saddest thing, one of the saddest things that God ever has to speak to a person or to a people is, I would have. This is what I would have done. This is what I long to do. But I was not only not your last resort, I was never your resort. And yet you're among my people. So, you know, really a lament of God, Psalm 81. Psalm 82 is a psalm about when God is going to judge the judges. It's a psalm of Asaph. Asaph writes and he says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. In other words, what he's saying to the judges is, you know, you kind of go into your quiet little cloaked rooms and just the four of you or the eight of you or whatever it might be, you know, and giving a judgment, whether it's the Supreme Court or you know, Superior Court or whatever it might be. And he said, it just seems like there's only eight of you in here, but I'm in here. And I listened to all of the deliberation I listened to all of the logic, all of the debate, all of the arguments and that you base your decisions on. And so he's just letting them know that wherever that kind of judgment is, is going on, he's saying, I'm right in the middle of it and I'm, I'm standing in that congregation. He says, he judges among the gods. Now, the word gods there is Elohim. And in the law, when God spoke through Moses, there were the, the establishment of the judges, and there they were called in a particular place, Elohim. And that's a name for God. That doesn't mean that the judges were God, but it was for them to rep- understand that in their position as judge, their position was one where they were there to represent God. I mean, their identity was to be lost. It wasn't an issue of what they thought or what they didn't think or what they thought was best or whatever God wanted his nation to be ruled based upon what his words said. And so there shouldn't have been any, um, you know, uh, personal kind of interjections or, or tainting of, of the law. It was to be what God said. And so he judges among the gods of the Elohim, which was another name for the judges. And he says, how long will you judge unjustly? And so he, you know, he recognized that they judged unjustly. Imagine that, finding a judge today that could judge unjustly, but he found one right there in, in Israel. And so he, he warns them of that. And he says, how long will you show partiality to the wicked? I tell you, that really needs to be heard today, doesn't it? It seems today like the wicked have all of the rights. The victims don't have any rights increasingly. And, and uh, boy, what people can get away with. I mean, you get away with murder today. And and all, and so he's saying to these judges, now don't show partiality to the wicked. Now one of the problems is judges, in order to judge properly, they need to have a fear of God, don't they? Now you put yourself in a small town. And, and I, look, put yourself in Modesto. And, uh, but in any town, our size or smaller or whatever, and you're a judge. Well, you, by virtue of having that position, that's a prominent position. And so what happens? You begin to associate with prominent people. And pretty soon, people who have power, people who have wealth, people who have these kinds of things, begin to become a part of your peer group. And now, all of a sudden, they're your friends. And then now, all of a sudden, they're before you in the courtroom because of some wickedness that they've done. And God is saying to them, now, don't don't show mercy on the wicked here. Do what's righteous and, and don't be, you know, giving them something that's not due them because of, of partiality or because of relationship. And so the judges were to be set aside to where their lone concern was, was what God wanted. And, um, and you know, and that, that's the best way. It doesn't always, you know, happen because people do establish relationships and then they end up, you know, pulling strings for people they know and that kind of thing. And so he says in verse 3, God exhorts the judges to defend the poor and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy 
Free them from the hand of the wicked. So he reminds the judges, you're here to prosecute the wicked and protect the powerless. Not the other way around. You know, so, so use your position now to protect the powerless uh, against the, the wicked. And so that's uh, his exhortation to them. Verse 5, he says, They do not know, speaking of the judges, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All of the foundations of the earth are unstable. So God is apparently not impressed with judges uh, when they begin, to, when they leave his standard for how things ought to be judged. And he, he says concerning these judges that we're not doing what he wanted to do. He said, they don't know and they don't understand. And uh, I look at our Supreme Court and I, I don't think you can find a better verse for them. Not all the members of it, but some of the judgments that are coming down. And you just look and you say, they don't know. They don't know what they're doing. And they don't understand how far reaching their decisions are. And that's not just on that level, but but all over, he said, for they walk about in darkness. All of the foundations of the earth are unstable. In other words, God is telling them, you have the power to destroy the foundations of a nation. That's an awesome power to have. And I tell you, I don't know about anybody else, but I don't want that kind of power apart from the fear of the Lord. Because I don't want to foist my mores on the rest of society. What I think is right, what I think is wrong, what all those kinds of, it, it ought to be God that gets represented. And so he said, you know, because of their ungodly judgments, the foundations of the earth were unstable. They, they have that kind of power. And then God said, and I said, you are gods or you are Elohim judges and all of you are children of the most high, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. In other words, he's saying to them, someday you're going to die. And when you do, I am going to judge you. <laughs> you say, well, I wouldn't want to be a judge. You know, that's the idea. And to make a person fearful of, of that kind of a position. Again, he, he brings it into the New Testament where again James speaks and he says, be not many masters or be not many teachers. You're going to face the harsher judgment. And there are places in society where there needs to be an, an absolute fear and reverence of the Lord in order to do that position properly. A fear of God frees a person from the fear of man. And, and the fear of God needs to be greater than the fear of man. So God says, listen, you know, you're going to, you're going to one day stand before me and you need to know that so it'll protect you from making corrupt judgments. And then Asaph says, arise, O God, judge the earth for you shall inherit all of the nations. And so he calls now upon the Lord to, all right, come now and judge the Lord. Take care of this. How desperately the judges of any nation need to have that fear of God. And if they don't have that fear of God, then that nation is going to end up being subjected to the wickedness of the judges' hearts. And and that's a contemporary issue that we're dealing with as the moral standard continues to drop and drop and drop in our nation, then it's also dropping among the judges. And so uh, things that are unrighteous, things that are wicked now are being winked at. And so, you know, we look at our society, we see the prevalence of, uh, you know, we have legalized abortion by virtue of the Supreme Court. I would never want to be on that Supreme Court and have to answer for that decision unless it was to have voted against it. We have a Supreme Court that couldn't figure out what pornography was. Their definition was, well, we don't know what it is, but we know it when we see it. Well, way to make a real, you know, tough stand, you know, on that, on that, that kind of a thing. And of course, today we see, uh, as a clean organization here in our community, the bumper stickers, pornography victimizes women and children. And, and, uh, and yet we, we see the truth of that and the statistics bearing all of that out. And, and yet there's a silence among so many of the women's organizations as it relates to pornography. They're, they're in a straight betwixt too because 
they're dealing, you know, they, they, that would indicate that there's actually a right and a wrong. And then, and then that sword would cut their way too. And so, you know, these things, and, and then on the other hand, while all these things are being legalized, of course, you know, public expression of, of religion or Christianity is being severely curtailed. And so God gives a warning to the judges, Psalm 82. Psalm 83. is a song, a psalm of Asaph. And Asaph writes and says, Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult and those who hate you have lifted up their head and they've taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted to get together against your sheltered ones and they have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. And so here's Asaph. He's crying out about a conspiracy that's against God. God, they've, you know, your enemies have made a tumult. Those who hate you have lifted up their head. And then how do they express their hatred of God? By going after his children. Going after his children. And so, I mean, how, how can you more greatly hurt the heart of a father than to try and hurt his children. And so the identity of God and his children inter- intertwined. The enemies recognize. They, they see God. They see the relationship between God and his children. And so to be his children means that when they want to fight against him, they're going to you know, fight against us on these things. And so, so he cries out for help as it relates to this. And then he lists the nations that have kind of confederated against God and against Israel. He said, for they have consulted together with one consent, and they form a confederacy against you. And the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagarites, uh, Gebal and Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, uh, Assyria also has joined with them, and they have helped the children of Lot, referring to Moab and Ammon. And so he talks about all of these nations that have unified for what purpose? Out of their hatred for God and their hatred for God's people. It's interesting what will unify together in the battle against God, in a rebellion against God. We saw the, the pinnacle of that on the day that Jesus was crucified when the Jews sided with Pilate and say, we have no king but Caesar and all, brought them together in that, you know, fight against, against God's will. It's interesting that these nations that are listed, there are ten of them. You know, maybe a picture of what's coming someday. I mean, if you're ever alive on planet Earth and you see a confederation of ten nations in about the area of Europe, uh, working towards a common currency, uh, heads up, the Lord's returning. I mean, if you should ever see that, <laughs> Verse 9, God, they cry, Asaph cries out to God, Deal with them as with Midian, as with Sisera, as with Jabin at the brook Kishon, who perished at Endor, who became as refuse on the earth. And so Asaph is reviewing what God did to Israel's enemies during the period of the judges. And he's saying, do the same thing to these guys. Make their nobles like Oreb in there and like Zeb. And yes, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna who, sh- who said, let us take for ourselves the pastures of God for a possession. Oh my God, make them like the whirling dust, you know, transient here one moment and gone the next, like the chaff before the wind, powerless before it. As the fire burns the woods and as the flame sets the mountains on fire, so pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with your storm. And so he's saying, God, utterly shame them, utterly destroy them for their desire to destroy us and to destroy you. And then he cries out and says, verse 16, fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish, that men may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the Most High over all the earth. And so here he's saying, listen, I don't just, we don't just want them destroyed. We want you to work in such a way that they will recognize you and give 
you know, you the honor that, that you so deserve. One of the neat things about this psalm and one of the lessons that we learn from this psalm is that God is rarely operates more loudly than his enemies. The enemies are always louder than God. But it doesn't mean that God isn't working. And you know, so they, they have the clamor, they have the vehicles with which to carry the message, they have, you know, the confederations, they have all of that. But just because God seems quiet for the moment doesn't mean that He's defeated or that we're defeated or or that He's in any kind of trouble at all. You know, He's not in intensive care or anything like that. So so you know, he's, he he tends to operate very quietly and then one day, boom! <laughs> you know, whew. yeah, his death was reported prematurely. Psalm 84, the psalm of the pilgrim. Beautiful, beautiful psalm. And it's to the chief musician on an instrument of Gath, a psalm of the sons of Korah. And he writes and says, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. And so here is this man. He's on a pilgrimage, as we'll see in a few verses. And in his pilgrimage, he's longing for the sanctuary. And again, you know, sometimes it's not until you're not able to gather with God's people that there's that full appreciation of of what it means and really the gift and the blessing that it is. And so the strength of the words, his, his soul longed for it. Yes, he even fainted for the courts, you know, of the Lord. He said, even the sparrow, verse 3, has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. And so he's, he's kind of jealous of the sparrows that they get to just kind of go in. And it's kind of neat. You ever watch birds? <laughs> yeah. So, but, Sometimes they can get a pretty good seat to events and stuff. And so here they are in the temple. They're able to go in and build their nest and they get to see and be in the middle of all that's, that's going on there. And he longed for the position of the bird that was able to, to see and be in the middle of it. You know, a bird has no appreciation for it, but, but he did and he desired the place of the sparrow if being a sparrow meant being in the area of God's presence and and the place to worship Him. He said, Blessed, verse 4, are those who dwell in your house. And so the blessing of having access to the Lord's house, they will still be praising you. And then he talks about the experience of the pilgrim. Verse 5, he says, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on a pilgrimage. And the Bible teaches that for all of us as Christians, we're on a pilgrimage. Uh, this isn't home. We're just on a sojourn. We're passing through. And so he said, blessed is the man whose strength is in you. And, and then, comma, blessed is the man whose heart is set on a pilgrimage. And so the blessing, he's saying, of being living life here is a pilgrim. And I say to that, amen. It is so nice to walk through this world and know this is not my home. <laughs> it is stranger and stranger to me every single week. And I don't, I don't want, I mean, I don't have to think about what it would feel like anymore, but I wouldn't want to live a life where this is it. This is home, you know. I want to be a stranger here. I am a stranger here. They think I'm strange. I think they're strange. You know. We're being made for heaven, and our hearts are set on heaven. As he talks about there are, whose heart is set on a pilgrimage, where a person's heart is really set on, you know, heaven is where I'm headed, and I can't wait. But as with the Apostle Paul in all of our lives, we're still here because the ministry isn't over. There's still things that he wants to yet do in our life. And then he says, as they pass through, verse 6, the valley of Baca, or weeping, they make it a spring, and the rain also covers it with pools. And so the image here is that the pilgrim is making his way through a dry place, and, and he hits, you know, thirst hits him, 
And so when he's thirsty, he begins to dig for water. And as he's digging down for water, you know, he he's ultimately able to get down and get some water for some refreshment. But the value of the hole that he dug isn't supremely for him. It's for when the rains come and then fill that hole and then there's a lot of water for the group that follows him. And so as we're going along and we find ourselves in that dry place, we're in, you know, where we're digging into the Word or we're digging into this or we're digging into that and we say, oh, what is this experience about and is this going to be wasted and all? God says, it's not going to be wasted at all because I know what I'm going to pour into that experience and it's going to be refreshing to those that are going to follow you in that place. And so that's the life of the pilgrim. The pilgrim lives to make life better for for other people, those that are going to follow him. And he says in verse 7, they go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. In other words, God is their strength. That's the only reason a person can live the life of a pilgrim or a stranger in this world is because God gives us the strength to do it. And then he says, every one of them appears before God in Zion. That's just a Nice poetic way of saying, you're going to make it. (laughs) Thanks for the vote of confidence, Lord. In Him, not in us. So he encourages them. The pilgrim's going to make it. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer and give ear, O God of Jacob. And then the pilgrim cries out, verse 9, O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. And I would rather be a doorkeeper, the lowest position in the house of my God, than dwell in the tents of wickedness. He said, I would rather spend one day, I mean, you know, be a doorkeeper one day in the house of my God. That is where God is. Experience the reality of Him in that place and who He is and and all of that than to experience a thousand days in the tents of the wicked. And all you have to do is take a thousand days. Don't do it. All you have to do is take a thousand days and just, you won't even make it a thousand days and go back and try and camp, you know, in wickedness once again and see how quickly we long for and would trade all of it for one day of communion and fellowship with Him that where He's not grieved or hindered. One of the great things about becoming a Christian is that He spoils us for the, for the world. You can't go back and be happy. You can't. It's just miserable. And so He says, that's what He, uh, give it all for just one day. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from those who walk uprightly. So, not, don't show your hands, but, there might be some of us here tonight where we look and say, well, you know, God is holding something back from me. Then it's not a good thing for you. Oh, no, yes it is. I know it is. No, then it's, if it's a good thing for you, you have it. Or He's building something into our lives so that He can then bring it into our lives and it will be good for us because we'll be prepared for it. But He doesn't withhold any good thing from those who walk uprightly. O oh, Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. So beautiful psalm uh, of the pilgrim. Great to be reminded of the fact that we are pilgrims, that we are strangers, that heaven is our home, this is not our home, that we're just passing through. And so we pick it up in Psalm 85 here. Lessons on restoration. To the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. And you have brought back the captivity of Jacob. Probably a psalm written when they returned from the Babylonian captivity. And he's just saying, thank you, God, for the end of your discipline in our life. And he said, verse 2, you have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sins. So he's saying, thank you, God, for forgiving me of my sins, forgiving us of our sins. You have taken away all your wrath and you have turned from the fierceness of your anger. And so the psalmist recognized the fact that they had been taken captive by the Babylonians, had been in that captivity, 
for 70 years and then the ability to return under Ezra and Nehemiah. They recognized that as being a miracle of God that nobody else could have done it. And so here they are in that place. They disobeyed God. God had chastened them. And now God is restoring them back to their you know, position, back to the land. And uh, it's a wonderful God that we serve. He really is a God who is eager to restore. The psalmist says, Restore us, O God of our salvation, and cause your anger towards us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? I mean, how far is this going to go? And so he's saying to the Lord, Lord, complete, you know, this work of, however, whatever anger you have left towards us, would you mind just doing it right now? You know, again, we want to move from the anger to the mercy now, as, he, as he's crying out now, Lord. Uh, remove all of that. Now we need a work of your mercy in our lives. He said, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your uh, salvation. And so he prays for mercy, and then here he prays for even more mercy from the Lord. Lord, complete, give us all the mercy that's necessary, you know, to overcome the righteous anger that, you know, you extended towards us in our rebellion against you. And he's asking for greater mercy, probably upon seeing the land of Israel when they returned to it. And when they returned to the land of Israel, it didn't look like, it didn't look anything like when they had left it. Now all of the walls are torn down. All of the cities are torn down. Everything's overgrown. All of the, you know, orchards, all of the vineyards overgrown and in disrepair and all. And there was kind of this idea that they were, might maybe in their mind just kind of come back and just pick it up, you know, where we left off. But it, but it wasn't going to, to be that way. And it wasn't going to be that easy. Coming back wasn't going to be as easy as they thought. Sometimes coming back to the Lord after a backslide isn't as easy as, as we think it's going to be. But it's worth, you know, working through because God is going to teach us lessons related to that. He said in verse 8, I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for He will speak peace to His people and to His saints, but let them not turn back to folly. And so he's confident of a lot of things here. He's confident of God's grace and he's confident that God is going to speak peace to them. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. And so he's sure that God is going to find a way for mercy and truth to come together. That's a beautiful, beautiful passage. Because we want God to be merciful, but never at the expense of His truth. At least I don't. I don't want Him to become something different. I don't want Him to be merciful to me at the expense of truth. It says concerning our salvation, it says that God is both just and the justifier of those who have sinned. In other words, when God was going to provide a salvation for us, he had to justify us who had sinned. Somehow, He had to cleanse us of our sin. He had to make us just as if we had never sinned. But how does He do it and remain just? How does He do it without winking at sin? It, with still communicating that sin is very serious in His eyes. Well, the way that He did it was through His Son. And so it was through the salvation that He provided, as we see Jesus on the cross, there is the means by which we could be justified in the eyes of God, just as if we'd never sinned because of our faith in Him. And yet, as we look at the cross, no one with any kind of, you know, spiritual life is going to look at that and say, God was, you know, winks at sin, it's no big deal to Him. And so, how could mercy, how could truth you know, come together. And so he was sure that God was going to find a way. They needed mercy, but they didn't want God to change his truth, you know, to accomplish that. And then the second part of the verse, you know, just as beautiful, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. And that's what ha happened in Jesus. Righteousness, right onness, and peace. They kissed together. The only way they could kiss 
as it relates to us and our sin and salvation was through the Lord Jesus. So verse 10 is one of the most beautiful pictures of the salvation that we have in Jesus and all of the Old Testament. He said, truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. So confident that the Lord was going to give them, you know, increase to the land, even though it was difficult for the moment. Righteousness will go before him and shall make his footsteps our pathway. And so for all of the difficulty of the trial that they were in, uh, Asaph is confident that the Lord is going to take care of things and he's going to lead us in his paths. And so there needs to be that when there's a returning from a backslidden condition there's that crying out to the Lord. Things are sometimes harder. You know, the restoration's a little harder than we sometimes, you know, think that it's it, it ought to be, or or whatever. Is is we're longing to get back on track. But at the same time, there needs to be that confidence that the Lord is merciful, that He is gracious, and that He does restore us uh, when we cry out for that restoration. Psalm 86 is a cry for mercy. It's a prayer of David. He says, bow down your ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am holy. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I cry to you all day long. Rejoice the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. And so uh, this cry for mercy, and you know, when we cry for mercy of the Lord, we need to be confident of verse 5, that, that He is good and ready and eager to bestow these things upon us. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer and attend to the voice of my supplication. In the day of my trouble, I will cry a, a call upon you, for you will answer me. And then verse 8, Among the gods there is none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like your works. And so he starts to meditate upon the Lord's greatness. And again, that's a repeated thing in the Scriptures. In a, he, The psalmist finds himself in a difficult place, and so often his mind will go back to the testimony that his life is of the faithfulness of God. And, you know, sometimes we can be in a room like this and say, uh, you know, uh, you've said that 175 times already in our going through the Psalms, and uh, we're going to hear it another 150 times before we get to the end of the Psalms. But really, the question, though, as is it, is it relates to our lives, is when we find ourselves in that place and in that trial, you know, do I yet look back to how faithful he's been and draw encouragement from that? It's not just a matter of having read it a million times, but over and over again that it might become a practice within my life. And so he said, All nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. And that's going to happen in the kingdom age. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. And then verse 11, he says, Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. And this is a beautiful thing. He's in a difficult, difficult trial. He wants out, but he also is saying, I want to learn what I'm supposed to learn here. I want to learn what I'm supposed to learn here. And so just that maturity. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to get out of the trial if it's supposed to teach me something without learning it. Because why? Then I got to retake the trial. And I don't want to retake the trial. And so, so here he's saying, listen, if I'm supposed to learn something here, Lord, I want to learn it and I'll walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. And so that, what's the best way to unite a heart that's being splintered in, in, in trial, you know, with emotions going here and, and, uh, you know, uh, thoughts going all over the place and all of these, these kinds of things. How can they be united? United in the fear of the Lord, the fear to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forevermore. For great is your mercy toward me, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. And so, as rough as this is, you know, he's, he's looking at the bright side and be saying, um, well, I want to look at, you know, the bright side of things here. Uh, I'm not going to hell. And, uh, you know, and that's, and that's a thought, isn't it? There's nothing to say, 
Well, you know, could it be worse? Yeah, you could be headed for hell. And so here he's, you know, there's a, a beautiful maturity in all of this. He said, oh God, the proud have risen up against me and the mob, a mob of violent men have sought my life and have not set you before them. But you, O oh Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. And again, we see that verse 15, important to understand this about God when I'm in the middle of a difficult trial. If Satan can get me to start doubting this about God, then I'm in big trouble. And so he, he takes and says, this, I know this about God. Oh, turn to me and have mercy on me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign for good that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. So a beautiful um, psalm, a real honesty in the psalm, uh, you know, a beautiful reality in the psalm as he's crying out to the Lord in that asking for mercy. Psalm 87 is a psalm of Jerusalem. Psalm of Korah, sons of Korah, a song. And it says, his foundation is in the holy mountains. And so uh, this is a psalm that talks about the Lord's love for Jerusalem. And so he tells us in Psalm 1 as he's meditating on Jerusalem that it's built on holy mountains. Psalm verse 2, the Lord loves the gates of Zion. And so Jerusalem is a city that is loved preeminently by God more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. And so city of Jerusalem has a glorious future. And um, as a Christian, uh, you're going to be there. So we all have a trip to Jerusalem ahead for us. By the way, our next trip we're planning is for fall of um, 1998. So a year from this fall. There's a thought. There's a blurb on that. See. Pretty soon we'll have commercials up all the way around. We'll have, you know, Pepsi and uh, different things. But anyway, that's that's coming. And then you'll get a chance to see. The, we need some corporate sponsorship, you know, and that kind of... But, but anyway, you know, the beauty of Jerusalem. And he says, I will make mention of Rahab and speaking of, of Egypt, and Babylon to those who know me. God is speaking, Behold, O uh, Philistia, and Tyre with Ethiopia. This one was born there. And of Zion it will be said, This one and that one were born in her. And the Most High Himself shall establish her. The Lord will record when He registers the peoples. This one was born there. And so, this beautiful psalm, the Lord is excited about Jerusalem in the psalm. He's excited about the future of Jerusalem. And He's excited about the fact that all of the nations are going to worship together, uh, worship Him together there in Jerusalem someday. And so, He's saying, it's not going to matter whether we were born, you know, where anyone was born, whether it was in Egypt or whether it was in Babylon or any of those places. He says it's going to be like everyone was born in Jerusalem. So you're not going to have, uh, you know, the Jewish person and the Arab and the this and the that and all of the schisms and the fighting and the different things or whatever it might, might be. He said it's going to be like everyone was born in Jerusalem. And, uh, and, you know, so, and, and, he, he, it's beautiful here because he, the terminology that he, he uses here is he, it's like he says, I'm going to disregard their first birth. I'm going to view everyone related to their second birth. And so, you, you know, you see, uh, of course, Jesus said, in order for a person to inherit the kingdom of God, they needed to be born again. And so here we see, you know, a beautiful picture of it here in the Old Testament. He's going to unite because of being kind of born again, so to speak, these enemies are going to be united together. That that second birth is ultimately going to have the preeminence. And, you know, in the body of Christ, the second birth, the fact that we're born again, ought to have the preeminence in our relationships with one another. And so he says, verse 7, Both the singers and the players on instruments say, All my springs are in you. And so that beautiful spirit that's going to characterize the kingdom of age, you know, yea, God, you know, go. And so don't forget every once in a while in the middle of what 
you know, we're living in and being salt and light in the middle of, don't forget to read the end of the book. And just remember who wins and, and, uh, and God's not sweating it or anything like that. And so all of this is coming. It's not like God said, you know, uh, I'm going to do all of these things pending the national election in 1990. You know, I mean, it's none of that kind of stuff. This is just going to happen and God's pretty chilled about the whole thing. Psalm 88. Psalm 88 is the psalm, I call it the pit psalm. It is, there's nothing perky and we'll probably end on this tonight. So, don't thank me. This, the psalmist here, as, as he writes this psalm, you know, the psalms are characterized typically by the psalmist beginning kind of down a little bit. He's in trouble and he's lost a little perspective. He begins, begins to cry out to God and the more he does that, the, you know, the bigger he realizes, the more powerful he realizes that God is. And pretty soon now he's seen the circumstances in the light of his God rather than vice versa. And so typically it ends on this, you know, this kind of a war cry and, and the, this boast of faith in, in our God and all of that. In Psalm 88, there's none of that. He begins bummed out, and if it's possible to be more bummed out than he was at the beginning, he is that at the end. He never comes out of it. Now, you know, a psalm like that would never make it in the Koran. I mean, for God to allow these kinds of things into His Word is is just a beautiful thing where He just looks and says, you know, there are times in life when it's just like that. It's just like that. Now, there's a reason, and I'm not going to leave everyone, you know, <laughs> I would have gone anywhere tonight than there. Have you ever seen anything like that Psalm 88 in your life? So, there are some neat things that are, are there, but, but, you know, there are just times where there just is no illumination as, as it relates to where in the world this thing is is going to go, and so you're just bummed for a while. You're just in the pit for a while. It's called a song, the Psalm of the Sons of Korah, to the chief musician, set to that, and a contemplation of uh, Haman the Ezraite. Now, Haman the Ezraite was a contemporary of Solomon. We find that out in First Kings chapter four, verse thirty-two. And if it, this Haman is the same guy. His wisdom became a proverb among God's people. I mean, when this guy opened his mouth, out came the wisdom of God. He was just known for being very, very, for having godly wisdom. We don't know what his problem is, but it's, it has a great possibility that the writer of this psalm is a leper. And, and if he is a leper, then he's in a trial on the level of, of Job. And so, he writes, this psalm in some time in the course of his life, but if that's the condition that he's in, if he really is a leper and he's in the middle of this trial and, and then out of this trial came the wisdom that was to bless an entire nation, then it's worth that trial. And um, I remember a year ago or so when even as we began prayer tonight, and I was, we were in India there, and, and, um, and I just sat in the back of, of the place where the classes were going on, and as I looked at these students, you know, they owned the shirt that they had on their back, and they're, you know, sleeping on something as hard as this would, and all just to get an education, biblical education, and a chance to reach their generation, to reach their, uh, nation with the gospel, and as I sat and I watched them, I just realized, and we chatted about it a little bit, but that for them to realize, you know, that in that school, they weren't just listening for themselves. They were listening for hundreds, listening for thousands, listening for tens of thousands who couldn't go to that school, but were going to be impacted by their lives. And so, when a whole nation can be impacted by your wisdom and it means going through the fire, then, you know, God knows that it, it's going to be worth it, though in the middle of it, you know, it, it can seem like this is, this is, there's nothing could be worth it, and yet it is, it is worth it. He says, O Lord, verse 1, God of my salvation, 
I have cried out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you and incline your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to the grave. God, help! I'm as good as a dead man. And he wasn't like, let's see, I'm, you know, got a bit of a cold and so what would, you know, sound poetic right here? I mean, you know, I mean, he is right at the edge of death as he, as he writes this, this thing. And so he says, I'm, my life draws near to the grave. I'm counted with those who go down to the pit. I mean, they're sizing up my coffin. I'm like a man who has no strength. And so he, he felt like a dead man buried in a dark place. That's a rough, that's, you know, that's, that's low. That's a pit. That's a deep trial. Adrift among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, and who are cut off from your hand. You have laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you have afflicted me with all of your waves. And so he feels like a dead man, you know, lying in his grave, a deep, deep grave, and now they're just you know, they're just waiting for the last breath to then just throw the dirt in on them. And then he likens himself to being, you know, a drowning man sinking under the great wave, wave upon wave upon wave coming over him. Verse 8, And you have put away my acquaintances far from me, and you have made me an abomination to them. I'm shut up and I cannot get out. My eye wastes away because of affliction. And so here he is. He's, he feels like he's a, you know, dead man. And now he's friendless. He says, I don't have, since that you're my friend, I don't, all of my friends have left me. And so, again, maybe the indication that he had leprosy, which would have rendered him unclean. And, and so he's absolutely friendless in, in all of, of the world. He felt like a leper. And then he says, Lord, I have called daily upon you, and I have stretched out my hands to you, Will you work wonders for the dead? I mean, are you going to wait till I'm dead to do something? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Shall your loving kindness be declared from the grave or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark and your righteousness and the land of forgetfulness? In other words, God, what good will my death serve? It's just one less voice to praise you. And there are not enough of them. And so he didn't understand. And then verse 13, But to you I have cried out, O Lord, and in the morning my prayer comes before you. Lord, why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? And that hiding of your face from someone was a sign of, of disfavor. And so when the, you know, there wouldn't be that, you just knew you were in trouble when the king wouldn't look at your face. And the, in the, Ancient cultures as it related to royalty, the king, you know, kings weren't chatterboxes in public. They may have been in other environments, but they weren't in public. When the king was sitting on his throne, he rarely spoke. Virtually everything he would do would be by motion. And it would be, he would give signals. And, and so his aides knew what the signals meant. So he never had to give, you know, any weight to a person at all by by speaking to them. That was an honor. So he would communicate by virtue of his hands. And one of the ways that he would communicate would be by his face. You were in big trouble if you came to see the king and he wouldn't look at you. You already knew uh, you're, you're just in trouble. And so that's how he's, he's seeing himself. He's saying, God isn't even, he's not even looking at me. I, what does this mean to me, you know? He says, I've been afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. I suffer your tears. I am distraught. Your fierce wrath has gone over me. Your tears have cut me off. And they come around me all day long like water. They engulfed me altogether. And loved one and friend you have put far from me and my acquaintances into darkness. And so here he's in this place. He's crying out. The end of the psalm, he's saying, God, I can't find you. Now, one of the things that's interesting in this psalm is you can look at this and say, boy, this guy doesn't have much faith. Ooh, be careful. 
be careful. He's still talking to God. He's still reaching out to the Lord. And the fact that he's praying to the Lord is an evidence of God's grace in his life. He wouldn't even be able to do that apart from the Lord. And so, you know, it's so easy, especially... We're so flippant as it relates to what we consider badges of spirituality and deep trouble and, you know, the positive confession movement didn't help and all of these these different kinds of things. Listen, the fact that a man... We don't know the depth of the trial. And the fact that he would continue to be crying out to God was miracle enough as it relates to his life and an evidence of, of God working in his life. Had God abandoned him? No, God hadn't abandoned him at all. God was the author of this prayer that he prayed. One beautiful thing about this psalm, as God includes it among the psalms, is that the psalmist just pours his heart out to the Lord, as we saw in one of the other psalms, where it exhorts us to pour out our heart, you know. And and one of the things is that it literally means to spill your heart. So, you know, when you're kind of growing up, when you're growing up as a kid, and you'd reach over to grab something at the dinner table, and you would hit your milk, and it would spill... And when you're a kid, what happens? It, it spills. All of it spills. And so it all spills forward. And that's the image that God's talking about. Now, one of the things that happens to us when we become adults is that when we hit the glass and it spills, we grab it so fast that maybe a third of it goes out or half goes out. And, and so our hearts never spill. They never spill. And so God isn't afraid of, of what this man's going through. And He's not afraid of this man's communication. He knows what he's doing and he knows what he's going to bring out of it. I remember hearing a man say many, many years ago, and it has anchored my soul in many difficult situations. And he talked about it in the context of a funeral. And many funerals are very, very hard to do. And what he said was, as it related to doing funerals and difficult situations, as he said, when you're faced with what you don't no, fall back on what you do know. And all of us are going to be in Psalm 88 at some time or another. And in those times where we don't know what's going on and there's all of that confusion, what do we do? We fall back on what we do know. That God is for me. He really is for me. That God loves me. That heaven is my home. He's going to be faithful to His promises in my life. He's going to work all things together for good in my life. You know, Romans 8 is a wonderful chapter to go to to find out how much God is for us. But that's, that's what needs to happen is to fall back on what I do know. And, and so when we're in that Psalm 88 kind of a place, it's important to do that. It's also important to understand for us as Christians that we never go through a single trial in our life that Jesus doesn't understand and that He hasn't experienced first. And that is a great comfort to me in times of trial, intended to be for all of us. The writer of Hebrews said, seeing then that we have a great high priest, Hebrews 4.14, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Again, as it relates to uh, Haman here, we don't really know whether he wrote this psalm before he became renowned for wisdom or, or, you know, what happened, but ultimately he became a great blessing to that nation. God was faithful, you know, to him in, in all of that. When God is working in our lives, he is working on a far larger scale than our lives. I was talking with one of the men in the fellowship this morning after the third service, and he was talking about you know, perspective and how the Lord sees things. And he had it so right. When our children, when they're young, they can only see out so far. And, and that's, that's the scope of their perspective. But the father, any father 
sees way out beyond that. And so he can console the child. He can encourage the child. He knows the child's safe, even though it's a tough time because the perspective is so much greater. You know, you make that infinite and we have a sense of the scale that God is working on. And so we hit those places where we despair all together in that place and yet God realizes that not a one of His promises is going to fall to the ground as it relates to our lives. I love this pit psalm. I just love the fact that, you know, someone felt free to pray it, you know, to the Lord. Was, it, while I was, you know, reading related to this psalm, there was uh, a famous uh, teacher, uh, ancient teacher, who refused to ever have Psalm 88 read in his presence. He felt it was blasphemous towards God. And, and uh, how can it be blasphemous in, in his word this way? I, I just, uh, I think it's terrific.